Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome back. Um, okay, so I see from here that we have uh, 31 participants here. So I think we won't waste time to call the names one by one. The entire class is here. Right? So I'm good to clear the hands. Right, so we're going to start our uh, discussion today on um, we will review the materials that we have seen uh, for memory. Okay, we will review the materials that we have seen for memory. So let me just put this here. Okay. Okay, one moment now. Okay, All right, uh, much better. Huh? Sorry, I forgot to lower my mouthpiece on my headset. Okay, um, so today we are going to talk about memory. We're going to talk about memory. Now, I just want to bring your attention uh, to uh, data sheets. I just realized from uh, the uh, another lab session that, okay, so you are using the STM32F, uh, right? you are using the STM32F microcontroller. So this is the STM32F microcontroller's uh, data sheet. Okay? This is the STM32F microcontroller's data sheet. But bear in mind that, uh, as you can see from here, as you can see from here, right? As you can see from here, uh, if you look at this, uh, you know, this is your uh, microcontroller. What happened to my pointer? I like, ah, okay, my pointer came up. So this is your microcontroller. Okay, and you see inside your microcontroller, right, you have the processor and peripherals. Okay, so take note that oh, the microcontroller data sheet, right, tell you all about microcontroller peripherals. For example, your GPIO, uh, that's a peripheral. But if you want to know about the NVIC or uh, of the interrupt controller or the cystic timer, you notice that the cystic timer and the interrupt controller, they are inside the processor. So the, the things that are inside the processor, uh, you have to refer to another uh, data sheet. Okay? The microcontroller's data sheet, this one, only show you the peripherals. So what's inside the processor, uh, you have to refer to another data sheet, and that is the STM32F, uh, Cortex M3 Programming Manual. You see, uh, there is another, there is another programming manual. Okay, this is the, this is the STM32F, uh, programming manual for the processor. Right, this is the programming manual uh, uh, for the microcontroller peripherals. So you might be able to because uh, some students ask me. Where is the cystic timer? They cannot find information on the cystic timer inside this manual. Ah, that's because I was looking for it, so I couldn't find it. And oh, actually, the information for the cystic timer is inside another uh, data sheet. It's inside the Cortex M3 programming manual. Okay, so you can see the uh, uh, core peripherals system timer. So uh, this is the just decided to scroll in. Okay. So these are the registers for the cystic timer. I think I can push this over here a bit. Uh, cystic timer, cystic timer, where are you? Where are you? Ah, there you are. Okay. So this is the cystic timer, and then the, the information on the cystic timer registers. Uh. So you know you might be asking, uh, the cystic timer control register reload value register i cannot find it i cannot find it uh, in this manual where is it ah it's inside this manual okay it's inside this one you can find the cystic registers okay so just want to point that out all right uh coming back to our class uh, so we're going to do two things today we're going to do two things today number one we are going to discuss uh, the lecture six, right? We're going to discuss um, this one, right? We're going to discuss these lecture notes. So 
as I go through, uh, please ask me any question that you want to clarify on the materials here. All right, so after we discuss this, then we will look at uh, the quiz six. Okay, we will look at quiz six. Uh, but generally, uh, I just want to tell you uh, that uh, with this, uh, we have completed our discussion. Uh, with this, uh, we have completed our discussion of the uh, Cortex M processor architecture. We have finished our discussion. So labs also, we have uh, finished section A labs already. Section A, in your lab manual, section A, all the labs on the Cortex-M processor architecture. So the Cortex-M processor architecture can be divided into uh, three parts. The first part uh, is called the programmer's model. The programmer's model is the processor and the uh, assembly language. Okay, Programmer's model. Programmer's model is if you use the Cortex M processor, how does it look to you? All right. What is the model of the processor to you as the programmer? So as the programmer, how you view the processor is in terms of the CPU registers and assembly instructions, because that's how you use the processor. You write assembly instructions to move data between memory and registers and do operations of them. So that is the programmer's model, is how you build the processor. Okay. Now the next part of the Cortex M processor architecture is the exception model. <clears throat> the exception model is the interrupt system. Is the interrupt system. How the processor responds to interrupts, all the terminology and all the concepts of exception model. Okay. And finally, uh, the last part of the Cortex and processor architecture is the memory model. How the memory is uh, arranged. Okay, so the memory here is uh, you notice that the the lecture notes on memory is slightly more on the theory side. Uh, it's more heavy on the theory side because memory is uh, we need to know what are all the characteristics and the property of memory. Uh, we don't design memory. We don't use memory, but uh, we just need to know what are the terminology and the concepts. Okay, we don't use it directly, right? but we need to understand what it is. Uh. So it's a bit more heavy on the theory side. Okay, all right. So we are going to go and look at memory model now. Let's start our discussion of the memory model. Okay. And let me just maximize the screen area. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, Cortex M processors, uh, uh, in order to make the processor, uh, in order to aid with portability. Now, portability, uh, this word is very important. Portability. Portability means uh, if you write a program to run on one microcontroller, right, with minimal or no changes, uh, you can use the same program on another microcontroller. So you can, with little effort, by just writing the program one time, you can run it on many different microcontrollers. How is this possible? Because the design of all the microcontrollers are standardized. Hence, uh, your code is portable. It can be ported. Uh, that's what we, we mean by ported. Uh, moving your code uh, from one device to run on another device, we port it to another device, okay? And because the architecture of Cortex-M processors is standardized, uh, so you have little effort moving or porting your software from one microcontroller to another. That's why we standardize, right? And memory uh, is standardized like this. Memory is divided into, <clears throat> memory is divided into six sections, six sections. The first section of memory uh, consists of 0 0.5 uh, gigabytes or 512 MB. In other words, the maximum size of code that you can put in your memory is 512 MB, which is actually very big. 512 MB, that's very big for code. Okay, uh, And SRAM is another 512 MB, so it's fixer. It's fixer. Then you have your 
peripherals. Peripherals uh, are your registers. Uh, you know your GPIO port? That's a perif microcontroller peripheral, right? To control your GPIO port, you've got some registers. Uh, for example, uh, CRL, CRH, ODR, all these registers, uh, where are they located? They are all located here within this address range. What I mean by address range is code uh, is from address 0 until 2000000. This is 512 million bytes. <clears throat> and then the next one, another 512 million bytes. So the range of addresses for RAM uh, is from 0x2000000 to 0x4000000 it is a range of addresses so it must be within this range huh? that's what we mean by standardization okay why it must be within this range huh? the reason why we split memory huh, into multiple regions huh, is to allow the processor <coughs> that's your processor core huh? so we are using m3 as an example here huh? cortex m3 okay your processor core can access huh, the entire memory space of four gigabytes. Uh, the entire memory space is four gigabytes. Uh, it can access the entire memory space uh, in parallel through multiple buses. Uh, so it's not just a single bus. Uh, you notice uh, they are your processor connects to memory or uh, using multiple buses. What is the advantage of using multiple buses? Improving uh, bandwidth. Improving bandwidth. You see, if I only one bus then I, I can only make one access at one time but if i have multiple buses i can make multiple accesses at the same time i can access the this part of memory and i can access this blue part and i can access this yellow part at the same time so i can transfer more data per unit time that's what we mean by bandwidth having more bandwidth means you can transfer more data per unit time that's the first advantage of having of splitting memory into different regions uh, so that we can connect multiple buses to them. And you've got one bus to each region. Right? So uh, besides improving bandwidth, uh, we also improve power efficiency. Why? Uh? You see, uh, if I connect to code and data, I connect to code and data here, I'm running it at maximum frequency. So I can fetch code and data at the maximum frequency. But if you are connecting to peripherals, the system bus so peripherals, uh, you don't need to run peripherals at high frequency. Okay, so the different buses uh, actually run at different clock speeds. And you know, uh, because you have studied CMOS transistors, uh, you know that CMOS transistors, uh, they only consume power when they change state. So every time you have a clock signal, uh, you are changing state. So if your, your clock signal is higher frequency, you are changing state more often, so you consume more power. If your clock frequency is lower frequency, uh, you are changing state less often, so you consume less power. So therefore, we, we run the paths that we need to run high frequency right, at a higher clock speed. The paths that we don't need to run so fast, we use a lower clock frequency. And we can only do that if we divide the bus system. Okay. All right, so uh, coming back here, you have a code region, you have a SRAM region, you have the on-chip peripherals, and then these are the off-chip peripherals. Off-chip peripherals means, uh, for example, LCD or a touchscreen or some external device uh, which you can access at this region. This is normally not used. Uh. This is external RAM. So, you know, in some cases, some microcontrollers, uh, the internal RAM is not enough. Uh, it, the microcontroller can support external RAM. That means the mouse controller will have a special set of pins which allow you to connect to external memory, certain very specific types of external memory. Uh, and then you can access those external memory uh, at these address ranges. This address range. Okay, so we have code, internal RAM, external RAM, internal peripherals, and external peripherals, five regions. Now the sixth region, region number six, is this part here. This is the system region. Okay, this is the system region. So the system region uh, is subdivided into three parts. You've got the vendor specific. This is where the, the manufacturer, they put in their own stuff. Uh, you know, you must give them some flexibility. Uh. So this is where the, the vendors are, uh, they put in their own stuff. Uh. Right, these two are uh, the private peripheral bus and the uh, 
uh, external PPB. Private peripheral bus is called PPB. Uh. So you've got external PPB and internal PPB. Okay? The internal PPB connects to the registers, uh, CPU peripheral registers. Inside your processor, you've got peripherals. The peripherals inside your processor is the interrupt controller, the cystic timer, right? All, all these guys, are, their registers are all here. Okay? And then this private peripheral bus external, what, what does this connect to? This connects to the debug components. What is debug component? Debug component uh, allow you to see what the processor is doing without disturbing him. Let me give you an example. You know, right now, all of you are sitting in front of your computer, right? Imagine, uh, I don't know what's happening inside your head. I don't know what you're thinking, right? But let's say I have this technology. Oh. I have this cap, you know, this uh, hat that you put on your head. Uh. I have this hat uh, with a lot of wires. But I put it on your head. Oh. Then I can actually uh, observe what you're thinking inside your head. I can see everything. But I, don't, I didn't disturb you. So you're just sitting there, you're still doing your thinking. Uh, but by putting this hat on your head, uh, I can observe what's happening inside your brain. I can see what you are thinking, what you are uh, imagining. You know? So that's what you do uh, with the debug circuitry. The debug circuitry, uh, which you access here, you can control the debug circuitry. The debug circuitry uh, allows you to peek into the processor. You can see what the processor is doing. You can see all the memory contents, all the register contents uh, without disturbing the processor. Uh, that's what debug is like. Okay. So now, <clears throat> your processor uh, connects to this so many different buses. Uh, how does it do it? It does so uh, with a, a bus matrix. A bus matrix. So the bus matrix, uh, the bus matrix, uh, uh, let me... The bus matrix uh, looks like this, right? This is the bus matrix. So you got your processor, right? This is called a bus master. A bus master uh, is something that can init, start a bus transfer. That means if you want to send, send or uh, get data from the bus, uh, you need to start a transfer. And only bus masters uh, can start transfers on the bus. Who's the bus master? You got the Cortex M3, right? These three guys are also bus masters. Uh, example, uh, you got DMA controller. DMA controller uh, is also known as direct memory access controller. Why do you need a direct memory access controller? Okay, for example, uh, for example, uh, you want to transfer some data from memory. Let's say I got two thousand bytes of data in memory. I need to send it out through the I/O port. If you use the processor, you have to read a byte from memory, send it to the I/O port. Read another byte from memory, send it to the I/O port. Read another byte from memory, send it to the I/O port. If you if you use the processor, that's very slow. Number one, very slow. Number two, the processor cannot do other things. Right. So there's a special piece of hardware called a direct memory access controller. The DMA controller can automate the processor of transferring data from memory to um, external uh, device uh, by itself. All you need to do is specify the DMA controller. You just specify, I want to send from XRAM to this uh, serial port, for example. I want to send 2,000 bytes. I want to send 2,000 bytes from memory starting at a certain address. I want to send it out to the I.O. port. Once you specify this, uh, the DMA controller will then automatically start the transfer without CPU intervention. And it will continue transferring until it is finished. Once it's finished, then you send an interrupt to the processor. Tell the processor, oh, I finished transferring the 2,000 bytes already. You see? We're excellent, right? Now, that's what the DMA is for. Speed up uh, bulk transfer of data without CPU intervention. The CPU just need to start the transfer. Let's say I want to transfer from memory 2,000 bytes from what address, right? And I want to send to the zero port. You just need to say, set, it, set the set initialize uh, the transfer okay other bus masters are ethernet and usb uh. now what's the advantage of having a bus matrix uh? bus matrix uh, is all uh, you see you notice that sram uh, is not implemented as a single block one huge block instead uh, sram is separated into multiple blocks right like this like this you see sram uh, is separated into instead of implementing sram as a single huge 64 kilobytes uh, 
is implemented as three blocks, 32, 16, and 16. Why? Because uh, the processor can be accessing the first, the first block of SRAM, the DMA controller can be accessing the second block of SRAM, and the USB or the Ethernet can be accessing the third block of SRAM at the same time in parallel. That's the whole point of using a bus matrix. Okay, so you can do more uh, with less. So now uh, I can actually do multiple data transfers uh, at the same time using this bus matrix. Okay, so this is just a general block diagram. This is uh, more detailed. This I just copy and paste this from your PC1768 data sheet. Okay, All right. So that's the bus matrix. Now, let me bring your attention uh, to a specific part of memory. Okay, you see, code is just to store instructions. Uh. SRAM is to store three things. Uh, data, which is your variables, stack and heap. Right? You already learned this, right? SRAM, we use it to store data, stack and heap. So that's all. Uh. That's all there is to it. Peripherals, these are all your microcontroller uh, registers. right? Uh, external RAM and external devices, normally not used. So I want to bring your attention uh, to this part of memory. This is the system memory. Right, this is the system memory. So the system memory, just now we say, got the PPB, private peripheral bus. You've got the debug components and the internal processor components. Okay. Now, the debug components are, are the great out areas here. We will talk about debug uh, in detail on week 12. So now we just, uh, oh, these are debug. Okay, that's it. Uh, we'll come back to this in detail on week 12. Now, what I want to talk about uh, is the peripherals inside your processor. The peripherals inside your processor is here uh, inside this system control space, SES. So inside system control space, okay, let's zoom here a bit. Oops, let's zoom here a bit. So inside your system control space, uh, these are the things inside your processor, okay? So you've got your cystic timer, you've got your interrupt controller, You've got your memory protection unit, you've got your floating point unit, and you've got your system control block. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about in detail is the system control block. The system control block uh, contains registers that control processor operation. Now, let's go to SCB system control block. Okay, let's go to SCB now. Let's go to SCB. All right. So this is the this is the system control space SES which contains your system control block SCB. What are the registers inside the system control block? Okay, these are the registers inside your system control block. Okay, so this is the basic essential set of uh, SCB registers. You have eight here. We'll talk about these eight one by one in detail now. Okay. The first one uh, is the CPU ID register. So the CPU ID register, which is this guy, uh, you don't need to worry so much about all these numbers. Uh. This guy uh, is just the register that identifies the processor. You know, uh, when you connect the processor to your computer, you got your mouse controller. Let's say you got a mouse controller. You connect the mouse controller to your computer, uh, your development tools. Uh. Immediately, uh, the development tool will recognize which uh, model this is. Why? Because there is an ID register inside. It's just to specify what particular processor model, microcontroller model this is. Done. Okay, that's all there is to it. Okay, next one. The interrupt control and state register, ICSR. Interrupt control and state register, ICSR. What is ICSR for? Uh? Now, I need to bring your attention back to a previous lecture. I bring your attention back to a previous lecture. Now, you see here, uh, we got interrupts and system exception. Okay, interrupts are generated by parif. Actually, they are the same thing. Now they are they are called exceptions. Exception is anything that can disturb the processor. There are three classes of exception. You got interrupts, which come from microcontroller peripherals. You got system exception, which come from the processor, and you got faults. Okay, they are all things that can disturb the processor. So ah. Uh, for uh, interrupts, uh, for interrupts, uh, uh, sorry, for interrupts, uh, we got this register here. You see these registers, uh, these, these registers are 
in your NVIC, uh, they are to control the interrupts. So we got 32 interrupt sources, 0 to 31. We got 32 interrupt sources. So we can set, enable and disable the interrupts. We can set and clear their pending status, and we can set their priority, right? But this is for interrupts. How about system exceptions? It's not here, oh. system ex exceptions is not here, right? Ah, that's because uh, system exceptions is in ICSR. Okay. ICSR, ICSR allow you to set and clear the pending status of the system exceptions, which is uh, uh, system exceptions are these guys. Uh, I scroll back up here uh, to show you. Uh, okay. So, uh, exception number 1 to 15. Number 1 to 15, uh, these are system exceptions. 1 to 15, these are system exceptions. Okay. Reset, NMI, hard fault, supervised, call, pendable supervised, or system. These are system exceptions. 16 to 47, these are uh, in microcontroller interrupts. Okay. IRQ 0 to 31. So these are controlled by the in, uh, NVIC registers. Uh, okay. How about the system exceptions? So the system exceptions, they are controlled by SCR. It's ICSR, not SCR, ICSR. So you can set and clear the pending status of NMI, pendable supervisor call, uh, and SysTick timer. Okay. Uh, there is also another register, which is the, so now let me scroll down here, which is the SHCSR system handler and con system handler control and state register. This is to set the pending status of supervisor call. Okay, to set the pending status of SVC. Uh. Okay, so in other words, uh, your system exceptions uh, they are controlled by SHCSR and ICSR. How about the priority? The priority of system exceptions. So the priority of system exceptions are here. Uh. The priority of system exceptions is in SHPR2 and SHPR3 for the pendable supervisor, SysTick, and SVC. Okay, you can program their priorities here. All right. Okay, so we have looked at, um, let's go back up. We have looked at uh, CPU ID, ICSR. All right. How about VTOR, Vector Table Offset Register, VTOR. Vector table offset register. So this is the this is the vector table offset register. Okay. Why do we need to offset the vector table? This is this is your vector table. Uh. This is your vector table. Your vector table starts at address zero. That's why I told you, right? It always starts at address zero. Uh. But you can actually shift the vector table upwards by adding an offset. Then you might say, why, why I want to shift the vector table for that? Ah, there are reasons. Uh, for example, right, some microcontrollers, uh, they come with a bootloader. Right? They come with a bootloader. This bootloader program. You, you know your computer, your desktop computer or your laptop, when you turn it on, uh, your Windows operating system don't run first, right? Your BIOS runs first. You know, it's that black color screen with a lot of white color words coming out. That's actually your BIOS uh, running. Uh. Your BIOS is it's like a bootloader program. The BIOS will run first when you turn on your mouse controller. Okay? The BIOS uh, is what starts the operating system. Okay? So for mouse controller, some microcontrollers, uh, they, they might come with a bootloader program. If it comes with a bootloader program, the bootloader program will be located starting from address zero. Therefore, uh, this is your user program. The yellow color here is your user program. So your user program, and then you've got your user vector table. This is the bootloader program and the bootloader vector table. So if you, after the bootloader runs, then you're running your user program and your user vector table. So you need to tell the processor that please use the user vector table, not the bootloader vector table. How you do that is we have to shift the vector table by uh, this 10,000 and shift it up. So then how you shift it up, basically you just put 10,000 uh, into the uh, vector table offset register. Just put this value into VTOR. Put this value into VTOR. So uh, now your vector table will be shifted upwards instead of using the vector table starting at address zero. Uh, 
you'll be using the vector table at offset 10000 if you write 10000 into the VTOR register. Okay, right, that's the vector table. Uh, the reasons why we want to shift the vector table, there are three reasons. Besides a uh, bootloader, uh, sometimes uh, you might want to uh, you might want to dynamically change the vector. Why do we want to dynamically change the vector? What is the vector? The vector is the address of the intra series routine. What if you got a few different versions of intra series routine? Okay. For example, Cystic Timer Interrupt, right? you got the ISR, right? What if I have three different ISRs? for the cystic timer, and I want to run each ISR based on a certain condition. So if the condition is satisfied, I want to run a different version of the ISR. How do I do that? Then no, you have to change the ISR address in the vector table. How do I change the ISR address in the vector table? You can if you relocate the vector table. That means you, you put an offset. No? You, re you relocate the vector table uh, to SRAM region. If you put your vector table in the SRAM region, uh, then SRAM, you know, uh, you, can, you can modify the value right, easily. Uh, so then you can change the address in the vector table. Right? Change, when you change the address, uh, basically you're running a different ISR. Right? Okay. Next, uh, you can also, uh, you also need to offset your vector table or if you are running a program from SD card. Okay. If you're running a program from SD card, uh, SD card is external RAM, uh, then you need to offset your vector table uh, to the external RAM region, uh, go up some more. Uh, okay. So these are the reasons why we want to uh, use the vector table offset register. VTOC. Okay. So we know VTOC. How about this guy? AIRCR, Application Interrupt and Reset Control Register. This guy, uh, normally uh, we use him to reset the mount controller. Oh, you can actually uh, software reset the mount controller. AIRCR, this guy. Okay, AIRCR. So the ARCR, the important one is this guy. Uh, system Reset Request. Bit 2. Bit 2. You write a 1 to this bit, uh, you will cause the whole microcontroller to self-reset. Right? Sometimes uh, if you got a fault or you cannot uh, you cannot fix the error or you can just restart the mount controller if it's running by itself uh, it can it can restart itself uh, if there is an error that it cannot recover from so it just restart itself how will it restart itself just set this bit up but to avoid accidental restarts uh, whenever you want to write any value to this a IRCR register the upper 15 bits uh, uh, sorry upper 16 bits uh, must be a certain value we call this the key. Uh, you need to have an access key. Uh. The access key value is 05FA. So if the upper 16 bits is 05FA, then only you can modify the value in this register. So you're going to put a 1 here uh, on bit 2. Uh, when the value you write into this register, make sure the upper 16 bits is 05FA. Uh. So this avoids an uh, accidental uh, reset of the mount controller. Okay. All right, that's the AIRCR. And then you've got the system control register, SCR. System control register is to control low power operation. Low power operation. What is low power operation? You see this? This is the power consumption of your microcontroller. We look at current. Because power P is equals to IV, current times voltage. Voltage is fixed. Now controller voltage is fixed. Some is 5 volts, some is 3.3 volts, some is 1.8 volt fixed. Huh? But the current, the current no, depends on your clock frequency. Higher clock frequency means you consume more current. Okay? So dynamic current no, is proportional to your clock frequency. Huh? Right? This is the static current. Static current is the leakage current. That means that uh, even if you got zero clock frequency, even if there is totally no activity, uh, you will still consume some power because there is leakage across the transistors. It's like you now. Let's say you're totally not doing anything at all. You're just sitting down in front of the computer. Totally don't move. Huh? You're still consuming power, you know, where you are breathing. Your heart is beating, your lungs is moving. 
moving. Your brain is uh, inside got activity. So you're you still using power. We call that the static power consumption. Uh, right? Even though you're totally not doing anything. Uh, you have leakage across the transistors. Uh. Okay. So how to reduce power? We can put the processor to sleep, sleep mode. So when you put the processor to sleep, uh, you stop most of the clock signals and leaving only a small part of the processor running. Okay, so you reduce the power consumption. And you can totally uh, stop. If you totally stop all clock signals, uh, then uh, you have zero dynamic current. Dynamic current drop to zero, right? And it's just static current. Uh, so we call this deep sleep. Uh, so then you might ask, isn't deep sleep better than normal sleep? Then why don't I just have deep sleep? Why do I need to have deep sleep and normal sleep? Uh, this is this uh, uh, affects the wake up time. If you go to deep sleep, then you need slightly longer to wake up compared to normal sleep. The the longer is in, in microseconds. Uh. In microseconds to us is nothing uh, but the, the processor is quite a lot of time. Uh, okay? So basically the 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 deeper you go to sleep, uh, the longer the delay uh, in microseconds to wake up. Okay. All right. How to choose between deep sleep and normal sleep if you go to sleep. But before that, uh, how to go to sleep. Uh, if you want to go to sleep, you just execute the uh, WFI or WFE instructions. Uh, right? This is in assembly. In C, is underscore underscore WFI or underscore underscore WFE. Uh. We will talk about this in more detail uh, on week 11. So don't worry about this. Uh. Now we're talking about memory, uh, not low power. On week 11, we will focus on low power features of the processor. But now, uh, this is how you put the processor to sleep. So when you put the processor to sleep, uh, does it go to normal sleep or deep sleep? Ah, now we go back to the SCR, the SCR register. So SCR register, uh, it to deep sleep or sleep deep. Okay? You said it means when you go to sleep, it's a deep sleep. When you clear this bit, if you go to sleep, it's a normal sleep. Okay, that's SCR. All right, now the, the last one uh, is CCR, Configuration and Control Register, CCR. Okay, what is CCR for? CCR uh, ensures stack alignment to eight bytes, double word. One word is four bytes. Uh. One word is 32 bits, four bytes. Okay, double word is eight bytes. So it ensures that uh, your stack frame is aligned to 8 bytes by setting this to 1. What's the double word stack alignment? Ah, I, I bring back your attention to here. Ah. I just bring back your attention to this place. Ah. Okay, you remember that whenever an interrupt happens, okay, whenever an, uh, an interrupt happens, ah, your processor will perform automatic stacking. It will save the current value of the registers inside the stack. So your stack frame uh, consists of these eight registers. Uh, right? And the stack frame uh, must always start at an address divisible by, the stack pointer value must always be divisible by eight. Right? The stack pointer value must always be divisible by eight. If it's not, padding will be inserted. Why do we need this uh, for software portability? Uh? Because a lot, a lot of software is written uh, assuming that the stack frame uh, is double word aligned. Uh. So this is just for standardization. Uh, right? Somebody set this as a standard, so everyone just follow. Okay, so uh, if you want to ensure uh, that you have double word alignment, that means the stack frame is always inserted at an address divisible by eight, make sure that you set stack align bit to one. Okay. And that's the CCR. Okay, so we have completed our discussion of this, uh, all this SCB, uh, System Control Registers, uh, SCB. Now, I want to talk about uh, some, this, this slide here. You see this, this slide, very worthy, right? Uh, but actually, a lot of things here are not really relevant, uh, but it's all here for complete completeness sake. Uh. First of all, uh, let's look at this. Uh, Let's look at this. Uh, you've got your six memory regions. Code, SRAM, peripheral, external RAM, external peripheral, and system region. Okay, so you've got these six regions. Uh. Now these six regions have a uh, address range. Uh, okay, and now uh, we have access permission. Access permission. So 
uh, all the regions have full access except for private peripheral bus. The private peripheral bus, or if you want to access anything inside this region, uh, access memory here, you need privilege. This is for protection, uh, for security purposes. Uh. Okay, so this privilege, uh, you normally don't use it. Uh. When do we use it? It's when you have an operating system. So user code uh, will, will be given no privilege and the operating system will have privilege. Uh. So operating system can access this region to control the interrupt controller, assistive timer, etc. User code, right, you cannot access this region. Uh. Why? Because if user code can access this region, uh, you can disable the interrupts uh, and then the whole operating system will stop working. The whole system will crash. Uh. Okay, so it's like a security, a basic security model. Right? So access permission is a basic security model. So the next thing you you need to know about is the execute. Execute never means or you cannot execute code from these regions. You notice that you can only execute code uh, from code region and SRAM. You cannot execute code from peripheral region. Why? Like? Because peripheral region uh, is open to the outside world. For example, your serial port, uh, uh, the outside world, when they send data to your remote controller, the data will go into the serial port buffer registers. Uh, okay. So uh, if there is a hacker, or uh, the hacker go and send some data to your serial port, uh, those data is actually, it's not data, it's code. right? And if the processor execute those code, uh, it might crash your system. So how ARM protect against this is uh, they do not allow any code to be executed uh, from peripheral region. So you cannot fetch and execute code uh, from the serial port buffer registers, uh, for example. Okay, so it's a protection against execution of uh, external code. Uh. Right. Now, the, these three are uh, cacheable, shareable, bufferable. Uh. Uh, cacheable is for high performance processors that have cache. Uh. Microcontrol processors don't have cache, uh, so you can just ignore this. Shareable uh, is for multi-processor system. Now we don't have yet. Uh, our mild controllers are all single processor. But in some point in the future, you will have multi-processor microcontrollers. Then uh, shareable memory will, will be relevant. Uh, now it's not. Bufferable means uh, uh, when you write something from memory, uh, you can use a buffer because your processor might be faster than memory. Then you don't have to wait for memory. You just write to the memory buffer and you can go on with your life, uh, the processor. Uh. But for us, it doesn't really matter because my controller processes or you are running at a low speed. You don't, you are not, you are not normally faster than memory, so you don't have a memory buffer ideally. Okay. So, uh, the thing I want to talk about is, you see, uh, we have different uh, regions. We have different regions. We have normal region and device region. Normal region is here. Uh, norm, normal region is your code. Uh, SRAM, your uh, code and data memory is your normal region. Device region uh, is your peripherals. And then the, the strongly ordered region, uh, strongly ordered region is the PPB. Okay. So let's say uh, you got two instructions, instruction A1 and instruction A2. Now you write in your program, uh, you write A1 and then A2. So common sense would be the processor should execute A1 first and then only execute A2, right? In that order, because you write like that, you write A1, then A2. So processor should do A1 first, then only do A2, right? Must be in this order, or not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Because uh, your processor can reorder memory accesses to speed up the performance. Okay. So for example, let's say you've got two operations, like A1 and A2. Uh, uh, A1 might be delayed, so the processor will do A2 first, right? Uh, so out of order, we call this out of order execution to speed up the processing. Okay? So out of A1 and A2, uh, the, their order is not guaranteed. Uh, if A1 and A2 uh, are in normal memory, normal memory, okay? But if A1 is in device memory and A2 is in device memory, uh, then the order is guaranteed. Tick means the order is guaranteed. That means A2 will always execute after A1, right? If they are from the same region. So device shareable, device shareable, guaranteed. Device non-shareable, device non-shareable, guaranteed. Okay. And any 
if A1 and A2 uh, is in strongly ordered access region, no? that means your private peripheral bus. Uh. If A1 accesses something in your private peripheral bus system region, or A2 accesses something in system region, uh, then the order will always be the order will always be guaranteed. Okay, this is just uh, guaranteeing the order. Uh. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in memory uh, is uh, memory protection. Memory protection. So you did this in, uh, or you're going to do this in your lab six. Uh, right? So you see here, your processor, when it accesses uh, program memory or data memory, right? all accesses uh, will have to go through this guy called the memory protection unit, MPU. The MPU uh, monitors all processor memory transactions. Right? What does the MPU do? What does this guard dog do? The MPU is like a guard dog. How does it guard? The MPU, the MPU allow you to specify, right? You see here, this is your entire memory space. Your entire memory space. Okay? The private peripheral bus requires privilege and access is always allowed. Okay? Your vector table fetches are always allowed. Now everything else can be disabled. And then you can define up to eight regions. You can define up to eight regions. How do you define a region? You define the region number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The base address, where does the region start and the region size? You just define this. Right? Then you can define the region. Why do we want to define these regions? Then? Because uh, now this is for operating system. When you're running an operating system, right? you are running multiple user code, user programs. Uh. So each user program, uh, should be restricted to its own code and data. It should not accept another program's code and data. So we use the memory protection unit to limit each user program to a specific region which contains the user program's code and data. Right? Everything else uh, it cannot access. And if you try to access any anything else, uh, you will trigger a fault. Right? That's how the memory protection unit works you limit the access of the programmer to a certain part of memory. If it tries to access anything else, uh, it will trigger a fault. Right? So you can see here, we only got, we can only define eight regions. Uh. What if I need more? Uh, if you need more regions, uh, you can use this feature. Each region uh, can be internally divided into eight sub-regions. Okay, eight sub-regions. So this gives you more regions, uh. right? Okay. So that's all, uh, and these are the registers to program the MPU. Okay. So now let's look at quiz five. Let's look at quiz. Uh, sorry, quiz six. Let's look at quiz six. All right. First one. Which of the following does not involve the VTOR? Okay, if I got usage of multiple version of exception handler, yes. I got use VTOR, VTOR for this. If I need to run a uh, external program, yes. If I got bootloader starting from zero, yes. Okay, so this one, dynamically change exception vector in TPB. You know that you cannot fetch from TPB. XN, non-executable, uh, you cannot fetch from TPB. So you cannot do this, but this is wrong. So this doesn't involve the VTOR. This is wrong, right? Okay, All right. Next one. Which of the following does not involve using the stack? Which one doesn't use the stack? Okay, we use the stack to pass parameters to functions. We use the stack. The stack is involved uh, when we want to pass parameters to functions. Where did we learn this? Uh, it's actually here. Uh, when you pass, you see, before you call function, this is inside a function. Now, be, right before you call a function, uh, right before you call a function, uh, what happens is the processor will save these registers uh, just like interrupt, you know. This is just like interrupt. 
you know when you call when an interrupt happens uh, before the processor run the ISR it will save this into the stack right so same thing if if you call a function or before the processor run the function code line it will save the registers into the stack now once it saves these registers into the stack uh, it will free up R0, R1, R2, R3 R0, R1, R2, R3 uh, is used to store uh, input parameters you know when you call a function you can pass parameters to the function right uh, so uh, R0, R1, R2 and R3 uh, stores the first four parameters that you pass to a function if you pass more than four then you have to manually set up uh, right? but if you pass uh, four or less parameters to a function you know, it's automatically placed into R0, R1, R2 and R3 so then you go into the function now inside the function uh, you can freely use r0 r1 r2 r3 r12 sp lr pc xbsr why because this has been saved into the stack right now r4 to r11 are not saved into the stack right? so if you need to use r4 to r11 inside your function code then you have to manually save r4 and r11 r4 to r11 to the stack first okay All right then uh, uh if your function needs to return any value right? r0 and r1 are used to store return values so when you return from the function code you can extract the return values from r0 and r1 before restoring the register values okay so this is how the stack is used to support uh, parameter passing to functions okay All right so uh, and we know that the stack is used to store local variables the stack is also used to store program state during exception handling so uh, this is not relevant register reuse outside its life it's not relevant. okay all right next one what is the use of sub region disable uh, in applications the mpu sub region disable uh, help you to reduce the total number of regions used uh, okay so if i need to use a lot of regions uh, i can use srd to reduce the number of regions that i'm using uh, so that i can get more more regions uh, right okay uh, which of the following does not involve unaligned data accesses does not involve does not involve uh, so if you access packed data structure, then it might be un unaligned, right? If you access packed data structure, there may be unaligned. If you write code in assembly, the access can also be unaligned. C code doesn't generate uh, unaligned accesses. Uh, so if you write in assembly, you can do unaligned. If you directly manipulate pointers, you can do unaligned, okay? Uh, operation in big band region, is always aligned. Okay, where is that? It's actually here. I, I specified it here in your notes here. Right? Uh, right here. Okay, so this is uh, operation in the deep band region now. Okay, uh, it's always access. Uh, you always use word aligned addresses. Uh. So deep band region is always word align addresses so it's always aligned uh, this is another story right? no time to tell this story so operations in the big band region uh, does not involve unaligned okay operations in the big band region is aligned all right next one which of the following consecutive memory accesses ah so i got two memory accesses first one and second one which one guarantee that they will be in the the processor will execute them in the same order as you wrote your program if uh, both are accesses to peripheral region device okay you know sram is normal ma. if you access normal 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 region no? sram or code no? the program order is execution order is not guaranteed la. as long as you got sram or ram no, it's not guaranteed but if both accesses are to peripheral device region, then it's guaranteed. Okay. Right. Uh, what is the role of the stack align bit in CCR? Uh -huh, just now we saw this already. Uh. It guarantees 8 byte double word stack pointer alignment on your exception entry uh, when you 
respond to an exception or an interrupt. Guarantees that the stack frame is aligned, the stack pointer is aligned to an 8 byte boundary. That means your stack frame uh, is always placed into an address divisible by 8. Uh. Okay, that's the use of this bit. Okay, next one. Uh. Next one. Which of the following is not an advantage of having multiple bus interface? Okay, which is an advantage of having multiple bus interface? I have multiple bus interface. I got power efficiency because I can run the different buses at different speed. All right. Improve interrupt responsiveness. Why? Improve interrupt responsiveness. How do I improve interrupt responsiveness? Okay. Let's look at this. Huh? How do I improve interrupt responsiveness? You notice that after I do stacking, after I do stacking, I have to fetch the exception vector, right? With multiple buses, oh, you can fetch the exception vector and stack at the same time because they're going to different parts of memory, right? The stack is going to data memory. The exception vector is at code memory. So I can fetch the exception vector and stack at the same time. So after I finish stacking, uh, I already fetched the exception vector. I don't have to do this some more. So this makes my, my response to interrupts faster. I can respond faster to interrupts. Interrupt, improve interrupt responsiveness. Okay. Improve memory bandwidth, also correct. Uh. Now, having multiple buses uh, does not improve memory access speed. Memory access speed uh, is according to your memory technology. So if that memory, the technology uh, is 3 nanoseconds, no matter how many buses you have, you still need 3 nanoseconds to access that memory. It's controlled by the technology. Uh. So having multiple buses doesn't improve memory access speed. Uh. Okay. Oh, last one. Last one. Well, this needs some story here. This needs some story. Okay, let me check with you. Uh. Uh, do you have a class? Three o'clock class. No, uh, okay. I just need about 10 minutes for this uh, because this is more some this calculation type question. Uh, this is a calculation type question. Okay, so for this one, uh, let, let me draw a picture. Let me draw a picture for this one. Draw a picture. Okay. Right. So uh, this is memory, let me use a nice color. Okay, so this is uh, memory, right? So that's 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Okay. So this is your code memory, code memory. Yeah. Then this is your uh, SRAM. This is your SRAM memory. SRAM is starting from 0x to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Then this is your uh, peripheral region. Peripheral region. 0x, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, uh, we have something called, uh, we have something called uh, bit band. We have something called bit band. Right? So bit band uh, is, you look at your, uh, SRAM and peripheral region. Uh, SRAM and peripheral region. Uh, okay. So SRAM, uh, the first 1 million bytes, uh, the first 1 million bytes, uh, you have two choices of accessing the first 1 million bytes. Okay. You got two choices. Right. Uh, not 1 million bytes. 1 million bytes. Ah, 1 million bytes. You have two choices of accessing these 1 million bytes. You can access these 1 million bytes uh, as a single byte. Right? You can access each of these, uh, each of the memory locations as a single byte uh, or as a single bit. That's why this is called bit band. Because this band here, this band of addresses, uh, this band of addresses, you know, 200, so like this, uh, it's like this, like this, let me draw like this. Uh. Okay, let's say this particular memory location at address 0x 2000 uh, for example. Uh. So this is one byte. You know, like each of these in memory is always arranged 
as uh, bytes. This bytes are so uh, you can access this as one whole byte at this address, or you can choose to access just one individual bit. Okay, how do we do that? I know that if I access this whole eight bits, I use this address. Uh, but if I want to access this this bit, uh, what do I do it? Uh? Ah, you see here, uh, you see here, uh, uh, each of this, each of the memory locations in this one, uh, one million bytes region, uh, that you can access each bit uh, at an alias. There is an alias here. We call this the alias region. How does it work? Okay, like this. Like this. The alias region uh, starts at 2.2. Two. So, uh, if let's take an example, uh, this address 2000000000, you've got 8 bits here, right? You can access the first bit now uh, at this address. You can access the second bit now uh, at this address. You can access the third bit at this address. Okay? So, this is called, this is known as, this is known as the alias region. Okay? This, one is the alias region. The alias region uh, allow you to access individual bits in the bit band region. In the bit band region, every single individual bit uh, can be individually accessed through the alias region. Okay. And so if I want to access, now the question is, uh, so here, uh, the question is, uh, okay, I want to access C. How do I do it? I want to access C. How do I do it? So you need to know this address, the bit band alias address, the bit address. So if I want to access C, how do I calculate the bit address? So this is the this is how you calculate. This is how you calculate. Okay, this is how you calculate. The bit address is equals to the alias region base address. So the alias region base address is this one. Now you've got two alias region base addresses. If in SRAM, the alias region base address is 22. In peripheral, the alias region base address is 42. This fixed one. So alias uh, peripheral region start at 40. So the alias region is at 42. SRAM starts at 20. So the alias region start at 22. Okay. So you select either one. Now, then the next one uh, is the alias region offset. You need to add the alias region offset. Okay, let me write it here. Let me write it here. So your the bit address uh, is equals to the alias uh, region, alias region base, alias region base address add with the alias region offset. Right now, what is the alias region offset? So the alias region offset is the byte offset in the bit back region. This one is okay, this here. This one is equals to the byte offset in bit band byte offset in bit band region multiply with 32, right? Plus with the Plus with the bit uh, number, bit number multiply with four. Multiply with four. Okay. All right. So what is our question? What is our question? So our question here is our question. That is our question. So what is the word address in the alias region? Okay. So now this is memory okay so this here this is the gpioc underscore odr so this is the register okay this is the address what's the address i don't know what's the address right this guy is in the is a peripheral register so peripheral register starts at four zero 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 this is the peripheral uh, 
you know, a peripheral memory starts at this one. Okay, so uh, at 0x42000000, zero 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 zero, right? Dot dot dot, uh, dot dot dot, dot dot dot. So a particular address, uh, a particular address, uh, this one uh, will map to, I want bit 13. So this register, uh, bit 13 uh, is this guy. So this one will map to bit, bit 13, right? So the question is, what is the word address in the Elias region? This one, uh, what is the what is the word address in the Elias region? All right, so this is the Elias region. This is the Elias region. And then this is the bit band region. Okay. What is the word address in the Elias region? What is this word address in the Elias region? That maps to the GPIOC ODR bit 13. So I want to find this. Okay, so I, I need to find this address. I need to find, I need to find what is this address. Okay, but in order to find what is that address, uh, I need to fill in this equation now, right? I need to fill in this equation. Okay, so do I have the information? Now, first of all, uh, what is the Elias region-based address? Okay, the Elias region-based address we know is 42000000, right? This is the Elias region-based address. Okay, then I need to add, I need to add uh, byte offset Byte offset in bit band region times 32. Add with the bit number times 4. Okay, what is the byte offset in the bit band region? This is the this is the byte offset in the bit band region. This one here. This one here, huh? this is the byte offset in bit band region. That means uh Starting from 4000000, 000 000 000 000 000 000 000, uh, how many bytes until I reach GPIOC ODR? How many bytes is this? So this green color uh, is what I need here, uh, the byte offset. Uh, so I need this. Uh, so let me just paste this here first. Let me paste this here. Plus with, what's my bit number? My bit number is 13, right? 13, uh, 13. What's 13 in hexadecimal? What's 13 in hexadecimal? 13 is 0xd. 13, uh, 0xd. Multiply with 4. Okay, so I can just uh, write this first. Uh. Let me write this first. Uh. So this would be 0xd multiplied with 4. 13 times 4 is 52. That's 3, 4. 0x. 3, 4. 4 again. Yeah, okay. So it's 3, 4. Uh. So 13 times 4 is 0xd times 4, which is 0x34. Okay, so now I need to find what is the byte offset in the bit band region. In other words, uh, what's the address of GPIOC ODR? Okay, so now we need to look at what is the address of GPIOC ODR. Uh. Now let's go to UI's header file. Let's go to UI's header file. Okay, so now we are at this file. Uh. Control F, Control F, G P I O C underscore O D R. G P I O C underscore O D R. Uh, maybe I just look for G P I O C first. Uh. Oh, okay, there it is. Okay, I put here. Uh. I'm gonna copy this here. So G P I O C base is uh this one, right? Let's go back there. What's the next GPIOC? Okay, this one. Which is here. Right, so you notice that, huh? Okay, 
You see, this is the usual way you define pointers, right? This is the usual way you define pointers. Huh? So GPIO type def. What's, what's a GPIO type def? Okay, we need to know first, uh, what's a GPIO type def? Uh? So GPIO type def. I go back here, control F, look for GPIO type def. So there it is. Okay, so this is GPIO type def. I copy this, uh, I paste it here. Everything is from your device header file. Uh. Okay, so this is GPIO type def. It's a structure containing all the GPIO registers. So GPIO C, uh, is going to be a GPIO type def pointer to GPIO C base. Where is GPIO C base? GPIO C base is APB to peripheral base plus 1000. What's APB to peripheral base? Okay. okay, let's search. What is APB to peripheral base? Okay, I copy this, uh, I paste it here. Okay. So APB to peripheral base is peripheral base plus 10,000. What's peripheral base? Let's search again. What's peripheral base? Okay, what's peripheral base? Ah, there it is. So I copy this here again. Okay, so peripheral base. Uh, peripheral base. Peripheral base is a B1 peripheral base. Okay, so what's APB1 peripheral base? Let's search again. What's APB1 peripheral base? What's this? I need to start on the top. Press somewhere here. Find. Oh, okay. So I'm backtracking now. APB. APB1 peripheral base. Oh. I need to find what is APB1 peripheral base. Huh? Okay. Let's search. APB1 peripheral base. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see. What did I type there? Peripheral base. Oh, I need to find what is peripheral base, not APB1 peripheral base. So not important. No. I need to find what is this. Let me cut that one huh? and search for this. Peripheral base. Okay. Let me copy this. And go to the top again, because it's somewhere at the top peripheral base. There you are. Ah, finally, I got an absolute address already. Finally, I got an absolute address. Okay, that's great. So, uh, peripheral base is at address 4000000. APB to peripheral base is, you take the peripheral base at this all right, and then GPIOC base is APB to peripheral base at this. And GPIOC is GPIOC base. So what is GPIOC base? Eh? In other words, eh, what is GPIOC? Eh? So GPIOC, oh, GPIOC is or GPIOC base is uh, this value plus with this value, plus with this value, plus with, that's all. Okay, and, uh, oh, I cut this out, huh? I cut this out, I put this here first. So, da, 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 da. here. Okay, you see ODR, huh? where is ODR? ODR is, ODR is, this is starting from zero, Right, you see, this is starting from zero, uh, zero x zero, uh, because in a structure, you know, like everything is located sequentially, right? So this is starting from zero x four, and then this is starting from zero x eight, because each register is thirty two bits, ma, four bytes, ma, four bytes. So ODR uh, will start at zero x c, right? ODR will start at zero x c, uh, So uh, GPIO C so GPIOC ODR, its address, uh, the address is this one plus this one plus this one plus 0xc. So we get 0x4000000. Zero 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 
1100C. So therefore, what's the byte offset? The byte offset is 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001, 100C. 0, 0, Got it? This is the byte offset. Here, one, this is the byte offset. Huh? <clears throat> so I take this value. Oh, let me reduce the size a little bit so you can see everything. Huh? 22. Okay. So this would be equals to uh, <clears throat> this whole thing. Now, what's the byte offset? What's the byte offset in the bit band region? The byte offset is this value. So this is the byte offset. Huh? Okay. This out is on top here. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the byte offset. All right, now uh, multiply by 32. Multiply by 32. 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, c You want to multiply with 32. 32 is actually, 32 uh, is actually uh, 2 power, 2 power 5, right? So it's actually oh, this value, oh, you just do uh, right, okay? 2 power 5, left shift. You just do a left shift of uh, 5 bits, correct or not? Right? If you take this value, you multiply by 32, oh, it means you take this value, multiply by 2 power 5. I don't use calculator, so I just use the quick and dirty way. 32 is 2 power 5. Oh. If you multiply by 2 power 5, you just do a left shift by 5 bits. So you do a left shift by 5 bits. Now let's look at it in binary. In binary, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, and C. C is 1100. Zero, zero. Okay. So we do a left shift of 5 bits. Huh? We do a left shift of 5 bits. We are going to get this is the same. This is the same. But this one is going to get 1 is here because this one, no, we shift left for 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5. Shift left by 5 bits. Okay, so left shift by 5 bits. Huh? So you, uh, 1, 2, 3, 1. Then 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then 1, 1. Okay. So what's the value? The value is 0x, 0022018. Correct. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, just copy and paste this one down here. Huh? Okay, so this value is now you get uh, this one, and then this is here. Okay, so it would be zero x four two two two. 0, 1, 8 plus 3 is 11. 11 is B, right? 8 plus 3 is 11. 11 is B. And the last one is 4. Okay, so in other words, uh, in other words, uh, the, oops, in other words, uh, this is, 0x 4222 01b4. Okay, so if you access this address, or you can individually set or clear bit 13 of your GPIOC ODR. Okay, why, why do we have this type of strange thing? It's because you see, uh, microcontrollers, uh, we do a lot of single bit modifications. 
for microcontrollers, like we do a lot of single bit modification. But if you want to access a single bit, uh, the normal way is you have to read the whole register, modify just one bit, and then write it back, which takes three clock cycles minimum. Uh, one to read the value, another clock cycle to modify, another clock cycle to write it back. But if you use this Elias region address, uh, you can set or clear this bit uh, in one cycle. You just write a value to this register. You write a one to this register to set this bit, or you write a zero, you write a, you write a zero to this register to clear this bit in a single cycle. Okay, much faster. Right? There are certain things that you want to do in one cycle. Okay, so let me just reduce the size and you can print screen this if you want. So I'm going to put this nicely on the screen now. You can print screen this. Uh, let me make everything visible. Reduce the font size to maybe 20. Okay, everything is visible now. Uh, let me raise this size a little bit. Okay, and you can uh, you can do your print screen if you want. Okay. Right. Let you do a so just take a print screen of this. Uh. So this is how we arrive at the address zero x four two 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 zero one b four. Okay. Just press your print screen button. Uh. So print screen this uh. uh I, I'm not uploading this, I uh, just print screen this uh. So okay, print screen uh. five, four, three, two, one. Okay, done, uh. everyone is done. Okay. So this uh so the Elias region work like address algorithm, or is it more like address lookup table for it's like an address lookup table for Big Ten region. Uh. Yeah, yeah, to me it's right. It's like a lookup table. Okay, so now if you look at your quiz, oh, the answer is not here. Actually, the answer, oh, this one I give you a bonus mark. Oh. Anyone who do this quiz, oh, you get bonus mark. Because this partial answer, this one, oh, 4001100C, oh, this is actually the address of the GPIO CODR. Right? This is actually oh, the byte offset. Right? The byte offset. You for byte offset uh, is the byte offset. Uh, let me use green color. The byte offset is 0x4001 100C. This is actually the byte offset. Right? I put the partial answer here. So actually the final answer is 422201B4. Now, don't take my word for it. Uh, you can try this out. Go and write some dummy sample program uh, where you go and set this address. Write a one to this address, and then you check uh, your port C bit thirteen. Uh, is it set? Uh, you 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 can verify this. Go and write a one to this address. Right, set create a pointer pointing to this address. Then write a one to it, and you check whether your GPIO C or the R is it set or not. Bit thirteen. Uh, then you can verify. Okay, so uh, sorry for the extra 25 minutes. I should have done it at 3 o'clock. Right, but I think this one I should explain to you. Lah. Otherwise, uh, you don't know how it's calculated. Okay, right, everyone? Do you have any other questions before we stop here for today? Uh, Elias region is embedded in the processor. Uh, it's part of the architecture, right? The Elias region uh, is part of Cortex M processor architecture. So all, all Cortex M processors, all Cortex M processors, uh, all Cortex M processors uh, that implement this one, one million byte region. Okay. So in your SRAM region, the first one million bytes, and in your peripheral region, the first one million bytes, uh, you can access each bit in this bit band region individually via the bit band alias region All right so what you need to do is you need to calculate what is the bit band alias address 
Ah, so just now what I showed you uh, is how to get the address. If I want to set or clear a single bit in one of the bit band regions, I need to know what is the address in the bit band alias region. So to calculate the bit address is what I just showed you. Uh. Okay. In microcontrollers, uh, we always need to set and clear individual bits. Uh, and sometimes we need to do it within one cycle. Uh. Why you want to do something within one cycle is because we don't want it to be interrupted. Interrupts uh, can happen at any time. And if interrupts happen uh, while we are reading, modifying, and writing back, then we are going to have some trouble. You know? right? We're going to have trouble because uh, if you're reading and modifying and then writing back, take multiple cycles. If an interrupt happens in between, uh, the interrupt can mess up what you're doing. Uh, if, especially if the interrupt is accessing the same uh, variable, uh, it can mess up what you're doing. So to make our setting or clearing of a single bit uninterruptible, atomic, cannot be disturbed, we should use this single cycle operation. So setting or clearing one bit uh, in a single cycle operation, we use the bit band alias. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. Today, good work. Uh, what is zero one in the SHP? Let me scroll to that page. Uh, it's right here. Okay. Uh, SHP, you got you got two registers. System handler priority. SHP stands for system handler priority. So system handler priority, or you got two registers. Register two and register three. So it's uh this is an array. Uh. Actually, uh, it's, it's like this. Sorry for confusing you. Actually, it's like this. SHP arrow of oh, let me write in my notepad. Uh. Write my notepad is better. So it's actually a SHP uh, arrow operator. Oh, sorry. SCB arrow operator SHP zero. Uh for the first one. This is this one is uh, SHPR2. Uh, okay. And then this one uh, is an array. Uh, this is SHPR3. Okay. So 0 slash 1 is, as, as it suggests, uh, 0 or 1. Uh. This is 0 or 1. So 0 is SHPR2. 1 is SHPR3. Uh. But you have to check your your header file, it might not be zero or one. You see, you go to your header file, you go to your header file, uh, it's here. So we look at SHP, uh, SHP, uh, oh, there it is. SHP is here. All right, it's actually a, an array of 12. Uh, see here, your SHP uh, got uh, 12. Why 12? Uh? Let's see. Ah, that is, is written there. Why why is it 12? Uh, you've got system handler priority register 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So add together, you have a total of 12. 12, uh, 12 system handlers. Okay, 12 system handlers. SHP is the system handler priority register. So you, you got here uh, 12, this is an array of 12 because you got the system handler number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, number 11, number 12, 13, 14, and 15. So you have a total of 12. That's why these are 12 error. Yeah, right. You have to check the data sheet uh, for the actual implementation. Uh. Okay, so here I just put, because you really have HPR two and three, so it's zero and one, uh. but it might be more. Uh. Okay, it's, a, it's an array. Okay, all right. Uh, good question. Uh, anything else before we stop here? Uh, don't worry, if you come up with any questions later on, just uh, feel free to email me or WhatsApp. Lah. Okay, all right. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Good work, and I'll see you in the next class.